calling all SaaS heroes. We've got the cheat code for early stage SaaS founders to help you find your first customers. We'll be focusing on four unique strategies and giving you the tools you need to have a successful launch and spark early growth. If you have less than 500 customers, you'll want to power on and level up your SaaS. Join us March 23rd through the 25th from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time each day. Explore the world map of MicroConf Remote, visit the Power Up Lounge, and explore the community of vendors who will help you beat the final boss. Register at microconfremote.com. And we are live. Welcome to this week's episode of MicroConf on Air with the eerie theme music. I dig it. Producer Xander doing the 8-bit kind of minor theme. I'm trying to, there's the one game where you were in the graveyard on the NES. It's, that's grooving, man. Welcome to today's episode of MicroConf on Air. I'm your host, Rob Walling. Every other Wednesday at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, we live stream for 30 minutes to this awesome theme music. And we cover topics related to building and growing ambitious SaaS startups to bring us freedom and purpose and allow us to value and maintain healthy relationships. We focus on relentless execution with a long-term mindset. We think in terms of years, not months. And as such, we don't burn ourselves out by working crazy hours, sacrificing our health or our relationships. Thanks so much for joining me this week. We're covering a topic that is near and dear to my heart. It is mentorship for founders and specifically mentorship for SaaS founders. This is something that I think you know, 16 years ago, I think back to 2005 when I started my blog, I would have been a little skeptical of it because when I would read magazines or listen to interviews or read books, the mentorship was always this grandiose um, Silicon, Valley, Silicon Valley. I mean, I grew up in the East Bay of the, of the Bay Area, so I hate to you know paint it all with a brush, but it was the venture scale. You need a mentor because you're going to build a billion dollar company and it's hard. And I always felt like, I feel like I can build just a great million, 10, $20 million company, and, and I don't need advice. I'm just going to do it on my own. And a big part of that was because there was no one else around doing what I wanted to do, which was to build these, this you know ambitious startup that didn't necessarily try to shoot for unicorn or bust. And what I eventually realized is that there are folks out there who are, are just enough ahead of you. They can be six months, they can be a year, they can be five years. They Maybe they've just seen 20 or 30 SaaS companies start and grow. And so mentorship is something that I have since become a firm believer in, as you can tell by, you know, microconf, just connecting folks one another to have those, those interactions. Mastermind groups are a form of mentorship. If you think about it, uh, the podcast microconf on air is a form of, maybe it's not direct one-on-one -on -one mentorship, but it's definitely um, sharing lessons learned to, you know, to a, a lot of folks at once. And today's guest is John Knox. He's at Wind Addict on Twitter. And John Knox is a SaaS angel investor. He's been in the microconf and the SaaS circles for many years. He's a, an investor in the Tiny Seed Funds 1 and 2. He's an active member of our Slack channel, and he, he chimes in and helps uh, a lot of our, our portfolio companies. He's an investor in One Second Every Day in Peter Sum's branch that is now turning into uh, reform. He is an investor in Matt Wensink's Summit, David Heller's uh, Reimbi app, and he is a avid windsurfer. Um, he's also working on a book called Wealth for Founders. You can find that at wealthforfounders.com because like me, he is a personal finance and investing nerd, and he and I have um, shared many a great conversation over talking about uh, high-yield Vanguard mutual funds. During the day, he's a medical device iOS developer. So a man, he's a renaissance man, a man of many, many talents and many experiences. I'm going to dive into mentorship with John as I welcome him to the show. If you have any questions for John or myself around personal finance, building wealth, uh, mentorship, you know, iOS development, frankly, anything else that, that you'd love to hear John talk about, please post them in the MicroConf on air channel at MicroConf Connect, and we will get right to them. Mr. Knox, thank you so much for joining me on MicroConf on air today. Hi, Rob. Thanks. 
Great to have you, man. You're coming to us from sunny yet cold, just north of Minneapolis, Minnesota. Am I right? That's right. It's a little overcast, but uh, I think it'll be better soon. That's great. And I'll be back. So I'm in California for about another, I don't even know, 10 days, 11 days, and then I'm heading back. So I'll be joining you then. They're in early April. Smart. Hopefully as the veil of COVID lifts, we will be able to once again resume. Remember when we used to do happy hours, John? We would hang out and talk oh, about things like in person. It, it seems like a dream at this point. <laughs> it really does. It's the before time. So I want to I want to dive in, John, to this topic: mentorship for SaaS founders. You know, when we asked you to come on the show, we know you have a, a variety of experiences. You could have chosen to really to talk about any of them. Why why choose mentorship for SaaS founders, and why is that important to you personally? Yeah, uh, I think mentorship is both underrated and overrated. Um, I think some people think of mentorship, they imagine that it's, you know, somebody's going to tell you how to do everything and it's magic and you don't actually have to do any work. And I don't think that's really true. But on the other hand, uh, you can basically uh, become aware of things you wouldn't otherwise become aware of through mentorship, right? If uh, you have a problem with, you know, iOS, I have a lot of experience in iOS, and there's a good chance that I can help you at least uh, find a, you know where where to look deeper, where to dig deeper in whatever problem you're having. Um, same thing for personal finance, or whatever. Like maybe um, you know, help for me might just be a comment in Slack, or it could be a thirty minute phone call, and maybe me just finding the right person for you to talk to. Uh, so it can be pretty easy on my side, but pretty maybe valuable for the other side if it ends up working out. It doesn't always work out but it can really unlock a lot of value quickly for, you know, it, but actually both sides, because I end up learning quite a lot from it as well. So that's kind that's of my perspective I think, on it. Yeah, I think the key piece, you know, the one s s phrase you said was unlock a lot of value quickly. And something that, that I have come to realize was over the last, well, it's over the last maybe 11 years total, but really it was only maybe four or five years was a point that clicked it clicked with me where it's like, wait a minute, me actually um, introducing a founder to someone who either winds up investing in them or winds up uh, becoming a business development uh, relationship, winds up doing an integration, winds up working for them, just an intro can often be worth, you know, hundreds of hours of, of work, right? Because if you post your Indeed job description and you promote that and you go through all the resumes and you get to this candidate in the end, I mean, that can literally be thousands of dollars, hundreds of hours versus if I know a candidate and I know you're they're a perfect fit for you and they decide that they want to come work for you, that intro can be incredibly time-saving. Um, just like, you you know, similar to what you're saying with, with iOS development, if there's a technical thing that you have learned that someone else hasn't, it's shortcuts, right? It's it's cheat, I hate to use the phrase cheat codes um, because uh, we're using it for MicroConf Remote next, year, next week, so I'm stealing it from producer Xander a little bit, but it really is, like you said, it doesn't work in every case, right? There's not cheat codes for everything, but when it works, it it is uh, amazing. Do you have a recent story or example of some advice that you gave a founder in the past few months where you feel like you really unlock something for them in a in a short amount of time uh yeah i won't go into too many details but uh basically someone was having an issue with a popular cloud provider and <laughs> uh, i did a little research and i looked at my linkedin and i realized that i met someone i'm pretty sure at a uh entrepreneurial conference not unlike microconf <laughs> maybe it was microconf actually who worked at this cloud provider and was one of the uh principal engineers on their cloud services and i sent that person a quick note and said hey uh friends problem uh do you have any advice for them do you have any pointers uh on, on where they should dig into uh this issue they're having and they immediately got back to me and you know, basically allowed me to do an email introduction between the two, uh, the founder and him. And uh, they had a conversation, which I, I think uh, was valuable to them. Yeah, that's great. Introductions are one. I think technical issues are another. I think um, a founder the other day was thinking through whether or not to do a big 
certain type of promotion that could be risky for them. It could mean a lot of money and a lot of exposure, but it could also, you know, maybe make their existing customers pretty angry. And not only did I know, geez, I'm hitting my mic, sorry about that. Not only do I know two founders who have, well, I guess there's three who've done it in the past couple of years, but I had done this a few times myself. And so there was just a ton of like, you know, in a 30 minute conversation to your point earlier, we could cover something that maybe you just, you couldn't get anywhere else, you know, or maybe he would have had to do cold outreach on LinkedIn to find someone else who had done that. You know, I mean, it just becomes this, this thing where you've either been through it yourself or you know the people who've been through it and you can, um, you know, quickly leapfrog them. I'm curious for the purposes of our conversation, um, when you think of mentorship versus advising, do you feel like they're, per, you know, perhaps synonymous? It's like being there to be a backstop and to, to um, give advice when, when folks need it? Yeah, I think they're, yeah, it's kind of hard to maybe to pick those apart, at least in, in my mind. Um, I think some of it is also um, being there to think through a problem from a different perspective than maybe the founder has. Because, you know, a lot of times we all have kind of a default perspective about approaching a, a problem. Uh, just think about anything. And, you know, uh, in iOS, there's people who like think about everything through, you know, MVC patterns, and then people who want to do the the Viper thing. And there's all these different ways of approaching a technical problem. Same thing with business problems. Um, but people kind of have their defaults, their favorite thing to go to. And sometimes, you know, it's just like, well, what if you did this? What, what would that look like for you? How would that change things? And bring a different perspective, uh, even if it's not necessarily advice, because, you know, the founder is going to know more than I do about their situation. That's, see, that's a big thing that I think some, if you've never had an advisor or a mentor, I want to call back to one of the first things you said in this conversation, which was an advisor isn't going to know, every, well, you just said an advisor isn't going to know everything. And that's true. And the founder is actually going to know their situation better. And the advisor is not a magic silver bullet that's going to fix impossible situations, nor are they going to, sometimes they see things you don't, but oftentimes when I, because I, I give a lot of advice. I'm, I'm a mentor to a lot of founders. And oftentimes I'm trying to push into them to get more information out and almost get them to unpack it and get them to see it in a new way. I, so again, sometimes I have unique insights because I've like, oh, I've seen this before and I can just pattern match on top of it, of, of the options. There's only three options here. Boom, boom, boom. Here's how to negotiate that or whatever. But Oftentimes it's helping the, it's pulling it out of the founder. You know, it's not just a sanity check, but a little bit mini therapist almost of asking, I ask more questions than I, than I talk in, in advice sessions because I'm trying to get info for me to think about, but also for the founder to come to their own realizations often. Do you find that similar with, with your work? Uh, definitely. And not just mentoring, but like, being a, a manager or a team lead or whatever, like <laughs> if you just tell somebody that they need to do X, Y, and Z, they're not going to necessarily understand why or what your thinking is. Uh, so it's far better to get them to think through the implications of of your your reasoning. And you know, like I said, it's quite possible they'll come to a different conclusion than you know what I'm thinking because they know more about the situation. And you know, frankly, more about their own skill sets and uh, what they're willing to do. So, yeah, all, asking questions a lot of times is way more valuable than giving answers. I think because right. uh, sometimes it'll prompt them to be more creative, and we'll, they'll think of something that neither of us had thought about before. Yep. We have a question from the audience from Pablo Fernandez. He says, do you follow up with people, with the people you help with a specific problem to see how it went and to find further opportunities to help? How do you organize this? Huh. I have some thoughts, but yeah, why don't you start? <laughs> well, I don't, I don't know if I'm super organized about it, but I, I generally try to, to follow up afterwards and, and see how things are going. But, um, you know, if somebody's come to me with a problem before, I don't think I need to prompt for them, you know, to give me more problems. Um, <laughs> I usually have enough to do. And I'm, I'm confident if they ask me about one, they'll ask me about the next one. Yeah, what we've seen anec anecdotally, I don't have concrete data on this, but just in my experience is that founders who reach out and ask for help when they have a problem and then are coachable and 
not that they necessarily need to do exactly what a mentor or an advisor says, but they at least are willing to weigh that with their own opinions. Those founders tend to progress faster and, and be more successful. And I say that as someone who resisted advice and mentorship for years until, I mean, really it was only over the past, let's say eight or 10 years that I started making myself more and more open to that. Um, and I think that can be a natural, maybe a natural feeling in, in some of us to think I'm going to do this alone or, I, you know, I know how to do this on my own. But um, I've, yeah, I found that founders who reach out with problems will reach out with the next one. Um, there are also certain founders that I have a lot of touch points with. Obviously, you know, in, in terms of tiny seed, there's a lot of founders who I have um, talked to probably twice a month, three times a month. And those ones are easy because when they start talking the next time, I remember what we talked about last time and I'm able to ask and, and follow up. So I don't have to write that down. Then there are angel investments I've made that where I don't have regular contact with folks. And for those folks, when they ask for advice or thoughts, I give them the thoughts and I, I let it go. And usually they circle back with a text a few weeks later, oh, this is how it went. Or sometimes it's six months and I'll be like, hey, remember that situation we talked about? Whatever happened with that? Since I'm only brought in to talk about like pretty big things, it's almost like we're going to get bought. We're going to acquire a company. We're going to you know do something larger, at least with my angel investments. Those ones are big and they tend to, I do tend to hear how they end. Um, I think there are obviously some smaller, you know, a lot of smaller issues going on with with tiny seed folks. Um, there's a follow up. Cool. There's two more questions. Actually, this is great. Please keep keep them coming. Follow up from Pablo. He says, "Any recommendations on how to become more coachable?" Ooh, that's a good one. You have any thoughts on that, John? <laughs> Ooh, that's that's hard. I think going back to what you said earlier about being reluctant to take you know advice from other people. Uh, I definitely had, I probably still have that problem. Uh, it's it's hard because uh, at least I feel like you go through school and there's, uh, <laughs> schools don't like cheat codes, right? <laughs> they yeah. want you to, they want you to do all the work yourself and the group projects tends to be, you know, one person doing all the work uh, and that sort of stuff. And so I think you, you really need to, to be an entrepreneur, you'll benefit from trying to let go of that intentionally. And, you know, uh, even personal finance, I know a lot of people who want to do their own taxes. And I'm like, you're crazy. Pay the $200 and let somebody else do that work for you. What are you, what are you doing? <laughs> um, same thing for entrepreneurship. You don't need to figure out everything. You don't need to figure out your sales funnel. You don't need to figure out your whole marketing thing. Uh, you, you're allowed to ask for help and uh, try out other people's ideas. You don't have to own it. You should understand, you know, why you're doing it as best as you can, but you don't need to do everything yourself. It's not cheating to get somebody to help you out. Yeah. And I think my thoughts on that, on recommendations to become more coachable, I'll, I can say from my perspective of, of experiencing it firsthand, it was, I struggled to find the people that I wanted to listen to in the early days. And I felt like founders, I, I, when I was wanted to be a founder, I wanted to take advice from founders. Whether that's right or wrong, that was how I, I wanted someone who had started a company who had been in my shoes to give me the advice. In addition, I had, I really struggled to find successful bootstrap founders because it was like at the time MailChimp, right? And I'm um, sorry, it was, uh, it was Basecamp and MailChimp actually came a few years later. And I didn't necessarily agree with all the stuff Basecamp was saying at the time either. Um, so I really struggled to find anyone. Once I did, and once I started seeing people where I was like, they want to be ambitious, but they're also not going to destroy their personal lives. And they're willing to, to hold funding and bootstrapping intention. It's not this big dichotomy. I would never do this. I would always do this. People like Ahit and Shah, you know, and Jason Cohen. Um, I'm trying to think of like, you know, Steli FD more on sales. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of people that I just have a, a pretty deep respect for in terms of, of how they run companies. That's when I started realizing, oh, I can open up to them and say, hey, I'm struggling with this thing right now. What do you think? And just get advice. And that was the first step for me was just to ask for Because they shared your values. Yeah. That's the thing I think is a big thing is finding people that where it's like, I kind of want to be more like you. Maybe I don't, you know, Jason Cohen now runs WP Engine, which I don't have inside of information. I'm guessing that thing's got to be worth a, bil a billion dollars right now because when I got cashed out, it was worth close right. to that. <laughs> so, so I don't, and I don't want to do that. I don't have the desire myself to do it, but I do like the way he approaches problems and thinks about things. And again, you know, everything, do I want to 
be Jason Cohen in every way? No, I don't. But do I want, would I take advice from him? Because I think he's smart and I think he's been there. I would. And I also think he doesn't see the world as, oh, well, be a unicorn or, or go home, right? It's someone who can give me reasonable advice. So I think a big part of that is finding those folks who are, you know, just enough ahead of you and then being willing to weigh their advice with, to let it challenge your beliefs. Like I'm, so here's a good example. I'm working on my next book. I've talked a little bit about this. It's like a tentative titles like the SaaS playbook, um, looking at building a seven, like a million dollar SaaS app, right? How to get from zero to seven figures. And I have been so much more open in this writing process than any prior. So I have taken the table of contents and yesterday I sent it to four founders whom I trust. Um, and like Ruben Gomez is one, right? Derek Reimer. These are people that I have long, like decade long relationships with. And I trust that their opinion is not some flippant thing. They're not going to send me off on a rabbit trail, but they're going to give me their, they're going to be pretty honest with what they say. And I see that as a form of, maybe it's not mentorship, but it's certainly being open to feedback and advice. And I said, this is a table of contents. I love this. Tell me what you don't like about it. You know, and then I was able to pretty quickly pivot and give feedback. Um, based on that. So hopefully that's helpful, Pablo, on, on you know, becoming more coachable. We have another, we have two more questions. Another one, uh, or this is from Chris Willow from MicroConf Connect. He says, can you talk about what what's in it for the mentor if they're not an investor? And that's an interesting question to you, John. Are you a mentor to or advisor to any founders where you, you have not written a check? Hmm. That... Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure like, you know, not, not formal, but almost none of them are formal. Like I'm your mentor relationships. Um, definitely. I've talked to uh, countless people hit, you know, microconf, uh, and talk through all sorts of different stuff from personal finance to technical stuff to business stuff. And, um, some of it was just shooting the breeze, but some of it was, you know, thinking, uh, about what other companies in similar positions have done in their their situation and given them some ideas on that. So, yeah, I don't think I don't feel it's any different, uh, except for the fact that you know, if you're a random person, you're probably not going to have access to reach me <laughs> unless I see you at Microconf or right. some other right similar hallway. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, what's so what's in it for you in that respect? Then, you know, why why would you get spend your time to give a thought and advice? Well, because it's fun and educational. I usually end up learning something, uh, especially with the microconf crowd who, it, you know, they're extremely sharp people and you'll get a lot of, oh, okay, that's interesting, but what about this? And then you learn a new detail and you're like, ooh, that's a good question, I don't know. And then somebody else will chime in and you end up, you always end up learning something new or at least getting a new perspective or, um, I mean, like things like marketing techniques and tactics, they're always changing, right? Because what's available is always changing. So, you know, I will inevitably learn something about like, you know, I've heard about this new crazy clubhouse thing and how you advertise on that. Oh, okay. Interesting. Yep. And that's something I think, um, I guess, again, I'll come from my perspective of why was I giving advice? Why have I given advice to founders if I don't own part of the company. And I'll say a couple things. If you want advice from a mentor or an advisor long-term, and you do think they'll be extremely valuable, then they should get some advisor shares. Um, usually it's between a quarter of a percent up to, man, it's about a half percent to 1% of the company. That's typical Silicon Valley uh, numbers. And even the typical, I've seen some bootstrap founders do that, give away half a percent that vests over, let's say two or three years, assuming that the advisor is giving you advice. And what, you know, Certainly, some advisor's advice is well worth that plus. Um, however, I have also given advice to, I would say, hundreds of founders. I mean, if you don't, if you count individual advice via email and calls, it's got to be hundreds and hundreds since you know I started doing it in let's say two thousand eight, probably seven. And if you count the mass advice, you know, imagine like how many questions we've answered on startups for the rest of us, where it's not a direct mentorship. Um, relationship or a direct one-on-one -on -one call, but oftentimes we will dig into someone's problem and they'll come back and say, wow, I hadn't even thought that and that completely changed the way. So you might ask, well, why do that? Like, why would I spend my time doing that? And I think similar to you, John, A, it's, it's fun. It's interesting to think about solving problems. It's, if I have expertise in something, I, I guess I feel a little bit of an obligation to share it and to help other people. I've always had that um, kind of built in. And 
I think, yeah, I guess, I guess maybe that's it. So I definitely think it's easier if someone's an investor or like getting, you know, some type of, of equity to get ongoing help, because that's something that I don't commit to anymore of like, I'm going to give you advice on a monthly basis, you know, just because like, that's just not something I can do. But there are a lot of folks who might be willing to dip their toe if they haven't been an advisor yet. And they're trying to kind of work their way up and figure it out. I do think there, there's some opportunities. It's just not going to be the, um, you know, bu busy people don't have time for that unless they have to justify it somehow, right? Um, but folks who are maybe just getting into advising might. All right, I'm gonna, since we're running short on time, I'm gonna dip into our next question. S Spencer Polly from YouTube, he says, how formal are the mentorships or advising relationships you're talking about? Is there an equity split, consistent scheduled meetings, or is it more informal? What do you think, John? Mine are 100% informal. That that's, I don't generally have time to do it otherwise. Uh, you know, <laughs> if I was getting equity split, I'd certainly consider it. But yeah, that's, that's my situation. Yeah, and mine, mine is split. Um, I think that I've had a few. So I to give you context, I have, I think it's like 16 angel investments now Sherry and I have made. And those have been over the past 10 years. And then tiny seed is a but once we close batch three here in the next month or so, we'll have four, um, 40, around 40, 41, 42. So totally, total, I'm approaching like 60 uh, companies that I'm I'm invested in and, and thus advising. And I would say that obviously the ones in a current tiny C batch are more formal because they're scheduled. The ones outside of that do tend to be more informal, but I have had some founders say, look, especially early on, I would love to chat with you once a month for 30 minutes, just to, or even an hour to like, dump everything on you and have you sanity check and feedback. And so that has been something we've done. I found that it hasn't lasted very long. Usually after a few months, the founder gets their feet under them and they feel better about it. They get their footing and then they, you know, they're kind of, kind of taken off with it. Um, our next question is, oh, look, it's like an advice question, John. This is not about advising. It's a direct question about how to speed up oh. growth. So it's, Kenny N from YouTube, he says, I'm at the MVP stage and I'm in the process of promoting my SaaS app. It's going slow due to lack of budget. Any thoughts on how to speed up growth on a budget? you have any thoughts before I weigh in? <laughs> well, it's a broad um, question, huh? it, it, yeah, it really is going to depend on, on your market. Uh, if you can do something cheap like a, a publicity stunt, then that could be a way to do it. Um, but, you know, some markets that's not going to work. Um, you need to f figure out basically cheap ways to get coverage that, you know, don't require an advertising budget, perhaps. That's it. Yep. So you got, you have to look at what are the expensive ways to promote. Often the expensive ways are very scalable, right? Hiring a sales team, hiring SDRs to do outbound reach, uh, outreach, uh, pay-per-click advertising. Those are expensive, but they're usually really scalable. The ones that, and there are some that are the opposite or that are, that are cheap and scalable. They're just hard like search engine optimization, so organic rankings in any of the search engines, like a Google, a YouTube, an app store, um, or uh, what was the other one? Organic, oh, or just straight up content marketing, trying to go on the, for the viral pop, right? Of trying to get the, the articles that get to the top of Hacker News, um, top of what, Indie Hackers, um, growthhackers.com. You know, it's, it's going for that. And then long-term, you want the... Uh, or a Reddit, sorry, that's another one. And then longer term, you want the SEO. So that's what you have to do is go through the book Traction by um, Gabriel Weinberg and Justin Maris, and you got to split out which of these are expensive and which of these are cheap. In addition, next week, there's a conference. You know, there's a conference online, John. It's called MicroConf Remote. And oh, wow. It, yeah, it's cheat codes for early stage marketing. And we're covering at least four, maybe five in-depth early stage marketing approaches. And we're going to have um, founders or subject matter experts come on to talk numbers about very specific launches or, or tactics that they did in the early days to get, let's say, their first 100 or first 500 customers. And so Ruben Gomez with DocSketch, he's going to talk through his um, AppSumo deal that he ran last year. Derek Reimer with SavvyCal is going to talk through his... Wow. Um, 
product hunt launch that he did in January. And again, lay out the numbers. This is what we did. This is the screenshot of what we, you know, this is the approach we took. And we got this many thousands of, of you know, unique visitors and on and on. So we're, it's very, these are 20 minute sessions plus Q and A. And it's aimed at folks who are pre, let's say 10K MRR, who are trying, these are not super ultimate scalable. You're going to get traffic forever, but do you just need to get to, to ramen profitable or to, you know, default to live? That's what remote is focused on next week. Excellent. And with that, sir, that's our time. Can you believe it? It goes so quick, doesn't it? It felt like nothing. It felt like nothing. Thank you to Pablo and Chris and Spencer and Kenny for asking your questions. It was awesome. Kept John and I rolling on this topic of uh, of mentorship. And John, you're at Windaddict on Twitter. I'd love it if folks would go connect with you. It's been uh, you know great knowing you and working with you over these past several years. And uh, look forward to seeing you in the Tiny Seed Slack here. Thanks, Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. All right. Let's wrap it today. So Microconf Remote, I just mentioned it. Cheat codes for early stage SaaS marketing. Head to microconfremote.com and you can get your ticket. You'll want to get that in advance. There's a video game interactive environment. It is awesome. Uh, Producer Sander and I tooled around in there. So that's the, I think there's a uh, like a $75 ticket to have that whole thing. It's the video, uh, oh, there's a video only access pass that's less expensive, but the, the interactive environment is pretty sweet. So thanks everyone for joining us today. I'll see you next week at Remote.